There's the France, you know, with its must-see monuments, breathtaking landscapes and beautiful villages. But behind these places sometimes lies a more secret France, more surprising and disturbing. What if we were to discover the other side of the coin, the hidden face of our country? The Second World War left many scars all over France. Bunkers, Reich military bases, secret underground tunnels, not to mention the places occupied by the Germans. We've all visited one of these places, but do we really know their history? Stories that are often mysterious and secret. Today, Why did the Germans build a veritable fortress in the heart of the royal town of Saint-Germain-en-Laye? It's one of the most bunkerized towns in France. How did this military fort lost in the middle of the Pyrenees serve Philippe Pétain's dark designs? He therefore envisaged what would be known as the fortress punishment, i.e. political imprisonment in a place far, far away, locked up. Why did the Germans organize a mysterious ceremony at Les Invalides, right in the heart of occupied Paris? The Germans set up a whole ceremonial, one with the SS, with torches, with flags, SS streets, etc. SS streets, etc. Why did the ISIS prison become the most important prison for resistance fighters during the Second World War? ISIS was a penal colony like Cayenne. As tough as Cayenne, for Vichy, it's a model prison. Extraordinary stories, address rehearsal for D-Day. A secret Nazi base that almost changed the course of the war. So many forgotten sites that reveal hidden pieces of French history. just a few kilometers from Paris in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, birthplace of King Louis XIV. This town is steeped in French history. Many monuments still recall its royal destiny, such as the chateau and its magnificent terrace. It's hard to imagine that behind all these bourgeois mansions are dozens of World War II bunkers. Second World War. The Germans decided to build blockhouses or shelters There are 22 in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. This makes it one of the most bunkerized towns in France. Why did the army of the Third Reich concrete over this peaceful town? A priori far from being a strategic issue. But why were more than 10 Zero soldiers stationed there? A look back at a little-known episode of the occupation. An astonishing episode that made Saint-Germain-en-Laye one of the high points of the Second World War. It all began at the end of the Battle of France in 1940. Hitler commissioned one of his most important marshals to set up a super headquarters in the occupied zone responsible for the defense of the Western Front. The Oberkommando West, also known as OB West. This organization defend borders from Norway to Spain and overseeing the construction of the famous Atlantic Wall. The man chosen by Hitler for this crucial mission was Field Marshal von Rundstedt. And yet... Field Gerd von Rundstedt. He's the most famous tactician of the Blitzkrieg. In other words, of Adolf Hitler's victory in Europe, the most experienced Field Marshal in the German army is here.
Field Marshal von Rundstedt chose to settle in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. A strategic choice. The large houses in the royal town were ideal for housing the officers of the OB West headquarters. A quarter of the housing stock was requisitioned in Saint-Germain-en-Laye. The mayor says it's the busiest town in France. When you count the population, it's a third. Maybe half the population is German. This is Saint-Germain-en-Laye, under the occupation. Initially, the marshal set up his headquarters in the, in the Pavillon Henri IV, on the magnificent terrace of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. One of the royal town's most popular, but also most exposed locations. On March 3, 1942, Allied bombing destroyed part of the Pavillon Henri IV. The Germans transfer the OB West to this villa, Villa David. This is where Field Marshal von Rundstedt would take up residence here in March 1942. It was the Germans who decided to make OB West more secure by placing it further inside the city so that it would be less visible and less exposed to possible British air raids. The Führer himself wanted it to be more secure. In spite of this, Field Marshal von Rundstedt refused him to change his habits. The old Prussian officer is very attached to his freedom. He likes to stroll in the garden of the Villa David and use the terrace for his staff meetings. But as the war progressed, so did the threat of the Allies. Between 1943 and 1944, the town of Saint-Germain-en-Laye and the surrounding area were hit by almost 700 bombers. For Hitler, it became a matter of urgency to secure his precious marshal. Here we are in the basement. And sellers of the Villa David from May 43, there is a will, progressively in spite of everything, to secure the OB West. Berlin was eventually informed that the site was too insecure and demanded that anti-aircraft protection be installed on the Villa David. Von Rundstedt was firmly opposed. For him, taking refuge in a bunker was unthinkable. It was a matter of principle. But Hitler had the last word. Against the Marshal's advice, the Führer ordered the Tot organization to build a shelter under the Villa David. The work was carried out behind von Rundstedt's back while he was in Germany. On his return, von Rundstedt discovered the shelter. For him, setting foot in what he called a box was out of the question. The fact remains that Hitler, for his part, won't approve the shelter either because it's in a box, because it's in the axis of the house, under the house. And in fact, if this house were hit by a bombardment, the person inside this shelter, who once again is von Rundstedt, the order is sure at the top of OB West. If he finds himself trapped inside this shelter by the rubble of the house, he's no longer operational. No more order giver. Unacceptable to Hitler, this basic shelter was never used during the Second World War. But Hitler's fury did not wane. He demanded that another shelter, accessible, from the villa's cellars be built under the garden. Once again, von Rundstedt objected, and the work was carried out in his absence. So here we are at Field Marshal von Rundstedt's second shelter, built under the Villa David Garden, more spacious, better fitted out and equipped with a fan. Because the room is larger and above all with the possibility of outside communication, with a field telephone that enabled von Rundstedt to keep abreast of any operations that might be taking place when he was confined to this shelter. This second shelter also features an evacuation access, allowing the marshal to get out even in the event of a landslide. 
This shelter was used at least once in 1944. The anecdote told by Zimmerman, by Zimmerman, OB West's operations manager. In 1944, British aircraft dropped luminous markers over Saint-Germain-en-Laye. As a result, the general staff expected a major bombardment of the town. And Zimmerman wanted von Rundstedt to use this shelter. After tough negotiations, the officer finally convinced the field marshal to go down into the shelter. The operation is an important one. Zimmermann is so absorbed in the operation that he forgets von Rundstedt's presence. Von Rundstedt's presence in the shelter. And it's only after an hour that von Rundstedt uses the field telephone, which connects him to the surface to ask if he could finally get out of the shelter. Von Rundstedt never set foot in the shelter again. But the longer the war goes on, OB West became in Hitler's eyes. In 1943, the Führer recommended that the Todd organization build a series of bunkers throughout the town of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. Building shelters in Saint-Germain-en-Laye did not stop at building private shelters for von Rundstedt. The aim was also to ensure the safety of German soldiers and administrative staff in the event of an air attack. In the space of just a few months, the Germans erected a veritable fortress in the heart of Saint-Germain. 22 bunkers, including a huge telecommunications center. A very large complex was built near von Rundstedt's villa, a semi-buried command center. This pharaonic bunker will be the nerve center of the main headquarters. 60 meters long, three stories high, one, 200 meters long. A gigantic structure hidden in the heart of the royal city on a former stone quarry. The choice was on the southern flank of the Saint-Germain limestone plateau, where naturally there were caves used for stone quarrying for several centuries. It was easy enough to fill these caves with a concrete wall and create a bunker. A virtually undetectable and certainly impossible to destroy by bombardment. Built in record time and in the greatest secrecy, the Allies would never discover the existence of this bunker. Whose construction was undertaken by the organization TOT, which mobilized three groups of workers over a seven-month period of workers often requisitioned by the organization day and night to build this enormous edifice. Once completed, this bunker centralized all strategic information in France. It was here that all important decisions were taken, until the landings in June 1944. On June 6, 44, when the Allies landed, was there with all his telecoms department to try to throw the Allies back into the sea. So it was from this room, the map room, that Field Marshal von Rundstedt and his officers would supervise the defense of the Normandy beaches. June 1000, 1944. This is the heart of the matter. The nerve center of the situation, June 6, 1944. In this bunker had been set up the map room. From another room, the telecom room, information on the situation was received and transferred to the maps which were transferred to the maps by these telephonists. And as we've seen in the movies, they grow with a flag rule that gives the exact situation as it unfolds, allowing the marshal and his officers to try and cope. Two months later, on August 24, 1944, the Germans abandoned their bunker and left Saint-Germain en lay for good. The town was liberated by the Allies the following day. As for the bunkers, they were ransacked by the population and left to rot. Throughout the period of occupation, 
the French suffered not only German domination, but also the injustices of the Vichy regime. At the other end of France, in the Vallée d'Aspe, This military structure is one of the witnesses to Marshal Pétain's madness. Built between 1842 and 1870. The original mission of the Portolet Fort was to prevent, to prevent the Spanish from invading French territory. However, it was during the Second World War that this impressive edifice became famous. For entirely different reasons, Philippe Pétain used this military fort to settle with the former elites of the Third Republic. Le Portelet thus became a political prison. But the Marshal's dark intentions were to backfire. Who are these prisoners? Who, within these walls, were able to thwart the Marshal's ambitions? And above all, how did they achieve this feat at a time when the at a time when the Vichy government was imposing its omnipotence? In July 1940, Philippe Pétain obtained full powers and established an authoritarian regime. France had just suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Nazi Germany. For the Marshal, the Third Republic was solely responsible for this humiliation. Philippe Pétain was the representative of a France that had not lost out in 1418, which led to victory, which triumphed over the enemy. And alongside this France, he would like justice to make clear that the former elites of the Third Republic are the other France, the one that lost, the one that led to defeat. From then on, Philippe Pétain had one objective, to bring the former leaders of the Third Republic to justice. To this end, he created a Supreme Court of Justice. Five statesmen were targeted. Léon Blum, Édouard Daladier, Paul Reynaud, George Mandel and General Maurice Gamelin. But a year later, the trial of the five has... and Marshal Pétain was growing impatient. He therefore envisaged what would be called the fortress punishment, i.e. political imprisonment in a faraway place, far away, locked up. In the end, it was the Fort du Portelet that was chosen for the, the five political leaders of the Third Republic. The sentence was handed down by Marshal Pétain in person on October 16, 1641. A veritable denial of justice that the Vichy regime did its best to justify. The, the fortress of all possible evils it's a black fortress, a cold citadel, a citadel of fear, of fear in which the politicians in question have been interned. And so if we can't blame the inmates, we blame the place. And if they are present in such a dark place, they must have done something. Journalists will paint the darkest portraits of Fort du Portelet. In reality, however, the situation is quite different. The rights of the five prisoners are indeed violated. But on the other hand, they benefit from privileged conditions of detention. What we do know is that in 1941, the prison administration completely refurbished the Fort du Portalet to turn it into a prison to house these exceptional prisoners. For these exceptional prisoners, comfort is essential. So what's comfort? Running water in Fort du Portalet, electrification of the Portalet Fort, you can see one of the remains here. And these prisoners, they had to be prevented from escaping. So all around Fort du Portelet. They put up barbed wire, which turned the fort into a state prison. The prisoners were housed in the former officers' quarters, the most pleasant part of the fort. Their cells were furnished with the greatest care wash basins with hot water, individual toilets, electric heating. A young doctor has even been requisitioned to look after the health of these exceptional prisoners. So here we are on the first level of the officer's pavilion. 
opposite what used to be the intern's room. Since the prison administration had requisitioned an intern to look after these prisoners. To this intern, he had been given orders, the prisoners. Are prisoners who are set apart from the regime. But at the same time, they had orders to call them Monsieur le Président, which was addressed to Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Ministre, when addressed to Monsieur le Ministre. In their cell, the prisoners are kept in total isolation. They cannot communicate with each other. However, they are authorized to communicate with the outside world. On a daily basis, relatives, friends and lawyers come up to the Portalette Fort to visit the prisoners. So the families, families staying at the Auberge Belles in Ordos are entitled to one H of visits a day. So all these families go down, visit the prisoners, visit them on the terrace we have above, but also visit them in their cells. Visit them in their cells. And the privileges of these statesmen don't stop there. All prisoners have access to the radio and daily press, including those of foreign origin, which escaped the propaganda and the censorship of the Vichy regime. So on the one hand, we have this gloomy imaginary fortress presented to public opinion, but on the other hand, confidentially, these public figures benefited from a fairly liberal regime, which is quite common in the history of French political prisons. For very often, these very gloomy fortress sentences were home to very liberal regimes. Such was the case with the Bastille before it fell under the French Revolution. It was said that the Bastille was a sinister place of detention. The people held there were treated very well. The fate of the Portalette prisoners was sealed at the Riem trial, which opened on 19C, February 1942. The stakes were also high for Philippe Pétain. This event would serve to legitimize his authoritarian regime and demonstrate that democracy is a bad political system that had led France to defeat. But nothing goes according to plan for the old marshal. The trial turns against him. The defendants use the judicial arena to accuse their tormentors in turn. Bloom's pleadings, and Daladier's in particular, made their mark on the international press and public opinion, and it soon became clear that they were totally innocent. The almost crude facts of which they were accused. The judicial failure was such that the Rian trial never came to a conclusion. Nevertheless, the five Portalais prisoners were not released. In November 1942, just as the Nazis invaded the Free Zone, the five from Le Portalais were handed over to the Germans and deported to Germany. Four du Portalais remained under German command until the end of the war. The liberation of France by Allied troops marked the end of the Vichy regime. Pétain is detained in Germany and in July 1945, tried for high treason, sentenced to death. His sentence was commuted to life imprisonment by General de Gaulle, and once again, Fort du Portelet was chosen as the prison. General de Gaulle wanted Philippe Pétain interned for only a short time. Just a few days at the Fort du Portalet would be enough to bring history full circle and purge the Portalet affair. Philippe Pétain remained at Le Portalet for three months until August 15, 1945. He was then transferred to the Ile Dieu, where he spent the rest of his life. But the fort's post-war history was only brought to a close. A final visit by Paul Reynaud, one of the five exceptional prisoners. After the war, Paul Reynaud returned to the Valais d'Aspe and wanted to revisit his cell. And the story goes that on entering the room, he lifted a plank. Beneath this plank were hidden ropes. He drew a complaint. Behind the complaint was a file. This gentleman, who was of a certain age, imagined at one point escaping over the cliff. In the years that followed, Fort du Portelet returned to its original military mission until it was finally demilitarized and abandoned. Over 
800 kilometers to the east in the Alps Maritimes. Another military structure met an incredible fate in June 1940. On the heights of the small village of Santa Agnes, you can still see a witness to this incredible story. It's hard to imagine that behind this block of concrete, hidden in the mountains, lies a huge bunker. 400 soldiers could live in this 2-0 square meter underground fort. The Saint Agnès fort is part of an impressive defense system in the south of France, marking one of the most glorious pages in the history of the French army during the Second World War. Glorious yet little known. How could anyone forget this decisive episode in 1940? What was the purpose of this military fort? And what is it doing on this very spot? To fully understand this story, we need to go back to the 1920. Mussolini and his fascist regime were in power in Italy. At the time, the duty was clearly calling for the annexation of certain French territories, the county of Nice, the Duchy of Savoy, and Corsica. To this end, he made provocative speeches and openly threatened France. Of course, these were verbal threats, but the French government and especially the French general staff take these threats very seriously. Fearing an invasion by the Italian army, the French authorities quickly decided to to build a line of defense, the Maginot Line of the Alps. For contrary to popular belief, the Maginot Line was not limited. The German border. Between 1928 and then 1940, no fewer than 130 fortifications were built along the French-Italian border. A veritable concrete wall. Construction of the Saint Agnès Fort began in December 1931. Located on the heights of Menton, in an eminently strategic location, this bunker had to be impregnable. And no expense was spared. It took four years to design an underground city at a time when tunnel boring machines didn't exist, so we drilled with dynamite an extraordinary technique for the time. Extraordinary, the surface area was 2,000 square meters. We dug under 55 meters of rock. Just like all the Maginot line works, Fort Saint Agnès is concealed. The aim was to protect the troops. So here we are. We're standing on one of the two capes of the Saint Agnès Northern Fortification, which was equipped with two periscope turrets. Here, a periscope. A periscope for observing 180 degree surroundings. Soldiers could therefore see without being exposed to enemy fire. It's easy to understand that this is a buried structure. In this respect, it was revolutionary compared to anything that had gone before it. We could say that, just as the submarine works in immersion, underwater with its crew, well, the Maginot fortification works by burying itself with its own crew, too. A crew of 400 men who can live completely autonomously for three months. And right from the start of the Second World War, Fort Saint Agnès was on the alert. In September 1939, when France declared war on Nazi Germany, it expected at any moment that Mussolini, Hitler's ally, would also enter the conflict but nothing of the sort happened. The Italians didn't move, which greatly hindered Hitler's plans. The Führer wanted to open two fronts on French territory, north and south. Hitler began to have doubts about his ally's sincerity when he sees him procrastinating. It reminded him a little of what had happened with Italy in 1914, 1915, when they said, no, we're not ready, we'll intervene later, etc. And then in 1915, the intervention took place, but against Germany and Austria-Hungary and Austria-Hungary. 
this time the scenario was not repeated. In less than a month, Hitler invaded France. It was a debacle. Mussolini took advantage of the situation to declare war on France. When on June 10, 1940, at around 7 p.m., Mussolini announced in Rome's Piazza Venezia, Mussolini declared war on the United Kingdom and France. The French ambassador replied that our country had just been a stab in the back since, since the German offensive. It's true that we're practically down on one knee. And this expression is repeated in most of the June 11th newspapers on the front page, on the cover. Contrary to what Mussolini thought, Mussolini thought will galvanize not only the border populations, but above all the border troops. At Fort Sant Agnès and throughout the Maginot Line in the Alps, soldiers are on maximum alert. Alert. They lock themselves in with food and ammunition, everyone at their posts. This is it. Here we find the command center of the structure with the cartography rooms and, of course, the meteorology room. It's a strategic place because it's here that we'll make the calculations that will enable us to position the enemy and also provide precise information for the artillery men. Fort Santa Agnes has an impressive strike force. Here we are in the southern artillery block, which is considered to be the most powerful frontal artillery block in the Alps, since it concentrated six fire casemates on two floors. If these six casemates fired at the same time, the result was a very high artillery flow of around 60 rounds per minute, which for the time was obviously considerable. At Santa Agnes, you don't just hit hard. You have to plan for the worst. If one of the artillery blocks were to fall into enemy hands, it wouldn't jeopardize the rest of the troops. So if you take one hand, we find the palm, the palm and the mother gallery, the gallery of empty works, i.e. the barracks, the area where the men live and work. And from there on, gallery fingers at the end of which you'll find the combat blocks, the only ones to emerge from the mountain, where the heavy and light weaponry is located, as well as the upper floors. So what? The advantage of this strategy is that should one of the tunnel fingers be taken by the enemy, it can always be sealed off. This finger has its tip and in the end, the rest of the fort can still work. An ingenious system, aptly named Fort Palmer. In the days go by without the slightest Italian offensive. Why didn't Mussolini act after his declaration of war? The truth is, he secretly hoped to take advantage of the German victory to reclaim the French territories he coveted without having to fight. Hitler disagrees. This opportunistic attitude greatly displeased him. On July 18, 1941, he summoned Mussolini to Munich to call him to order. If the duchy wanted to recover French territories, he would have to conquer them himself before the armistice was signed. Mussolini's message was clear. The Rubicon had to be crossed. You can't just sit back and wait for a German victory to bring advantages on French territory. To do so, they would have to pay the blood tax and therefore launch offensives whether in the Alpes Maritimes, Dauphiné or Savoie. Mussolini's reaction was swift. Two days later, he launched the offensive. On the French side, all troops were mobilized. 
yet the battle seemed unequal. The Maginot Line in the Alps with 85,000 men was heavily manned. Over the Alps there were around 350,000 men on the Italian side attacking the line. So there are, there are geographical sectors where we'll be fighting one against four in proportion and others where we'll be fighting outright. One against six. From this point on, the forts of the Maginot Line in the Alps were crucial. But could they withstand this wave of Italian soldiers? Fort Santa Agnes was involved in the battle on June 22 to counter the Italian advance on Menton. For two days, the fort's artillerymen massively shelled the Italian troops. This quickly drove back the black shirts and the Italian attackers who were on the outskirts of the fort towards the old town of Menton, then towards the far east, east of the town, towards the border. The Italians were defeated, and for the French army, it was one of the few battles won in 1940. From June 10 to 25, 1940, the French works in the Alps fulfilled their mission to the very end. They fought valiantly, repelling assaults. And above all, saved the French from heavy losses. 37 dead on the French side. The Italians, for their part, suffered 30 times as many, with 642 dead. As for Fort Sainte Agnès, suffered no damage whatsoever, making it one of the finest witnesses to this forgotten history. As we have seen, the Second World War left its mark on many places in France. Places that have yet to reveal all their secrets. How will the quiet little town of Dieppe become the scene of the dress rehearsal for the Normandy landings? What secret weapons were hidden at the Mimoyec base in northern France? Which horrors happened in the Camp de Milles in southeastern France? Let's take a look at how these places still harbor dark secrets today. In the summer of 1000, 1943, the Vichy regime's prisons were no longer reliable. They were faced with a massive wave of escapes by resistance fighters. Pierre Laval's government had to find a solution at all costs. It decided to concentrate all resistance prisoners on French territory in a single prison. This was the ISIS prison, located in Villeneuve-sur-Lot, in southwestern France. This former abbey was not chosen by chance for its sinister reputation. ISIS is a penal colony like Cayenne, just as harsh as Cayenne. For Vichy, it's a model prison. It's the safest prison in France. ISIS a model prison? If the Vichy regime is convinced of this, the reality is very different. While Vichy had no idea, the inmates gradually transformed the prison. And above all, in the greatest secrecy, they devised the biggest escape plan ever devised. In October 1943, the first resistance prisoners arrived at ISIS prison. Communists or Gaullists, all currents of the resistance were represented in the prison. There were 23 nationalities, and it was a veritable Tower of Babel. Of all those who had fought against Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, and Pétain. The prison soon became overcrowded. In just a few weeks, the number of inmates rose from 200 to over one. 200. The prison administration was overwhelmed. The director who runs the prison has the same number of warders and guards to maintain order in his prison. He began by asking Vichy for the possibility, the possibility of arming the guards, which Vichy refused to do, because the weapons might end up in the hands of resistance fighters. For their part, 
the resistance prisoners unanimously rejected convict status and organized themselves to negotiate with the prison governor. Here we are in courtyard three, one of the four courtyards of the prison where the inmates live. So as soon as they arrived on a massive scale in October 43, the inmates appointed two delegates to represent them in their dealings with management. To the management, Stefan Fuchs representing the Gaullist inmates and Henri Ozias representing the communist prisoners. They will negotiate on a day-to-day -day basis with Monsieur Lassalle, the director of the Marge de Liberté, and bring down the harsh regime of the ISIS penal colony. The prisoners quickly won their first victory. They were no longer obliged to shave their heads. They won the right to express themselves, to assemble and to move freely within the prison walls. But the prisoners don't stop there. They kept up constant pressure on the prison governor to further extend their autonomy within the prison. They want to be full-fledged citizens, even in the Vichy prison, so they struggle to demand freedom to receive their families, freedom to receive parcels, freedom to receive newspapers, books, education, culture, sport, freedom of expression. They even write underground newspapers. And the inmates were even granted the right to assemble. There was even a political meeting in this prison, in this courtyard, with an effigy of General de Gaulle, and slogans calling for resistance and the building of a democratic future in liberated France. In reality, this cultural bubbling was only the hidden face of the collective organization of resistance fighters, who, at the same time, clandestinely organized themselves into military battalions. Each preo was organized under the authority of a commander. Some 30 officers provided military instruction under the guise of physical education classes. Everything is done very discreetly to develop an escape plan. With this utopia, this crazy idea of escaping at 1,200. To organize their escape plan, the prisoners set up their headquarters in the prison infirmary run by inmate Paul Vale. This strategic location enabled the leaders of the underground military battalion to meet without arousing the suspicions of the administration. Paul Vale, who was the chief medical officer, would call in sick a number of prisoners to fine-tune their escape plans in consultation with the outside world, of course. At the same time, thanks to complicities within the staff, to smuggle in regional and local resistance leaders. Here, prisoners organize secret meetings with members of the resistance. They even benefited from the support of the Conseil National de la Résistance, which sent a representative to prepare the collective escape. But getting one, 200 prisoners out of the ISIS prison was a real challenge. And to do it, you need weapons. 15 machine guns and 30 grenades were brought into the prison, thanks to the complicity of several guards. So here we are in a living quarters, a dormitory. Most inmates lived in overcrowded dormitories like this one. You can still see the marks on the bedsteads. It was three or four stories high. And so on these bedsteads, the men of trust calligraphed clandestine messages to the outside resistance to coordinate the escape plan and at the same time under the wooden floorboards the thin submachine guns that had been smuggled into the prison in december 1943 the vichy government was alerted to the fact that resistance fighters were taking control of ice's prison the model prison had turned into a rebel prison the director was dismissed. He was replaced by Joseph Chivert, a fanatical militiaman. So they sent in a warden who wasn't a member of the prison administration, who was a former legionnaire, who was a militiaman. 
A militiaman in France at the time was an SS man who took the Hitler oath. So it was he and his henchmen who took charge of the prison. As soon as he arrived, Joseph Chivit instituted a regime of terror. It was a return to the ISIS penal colony. No movement, imposed silence, bullying. So here we are in a special part of the prison. These are chicken cages where prisoners were locked up between 7 p.m. in the evening and 7 a.m. in the morning. Under Warden LaSalle, they were allowed to leave these cages open. And when the militiaman Chivet arrived in January 44 to take over the prison, he stepped up the surveillance and searches. And from then on, the noose tightened around the collective and the escape plan was in danger of being called into question. We're going to have to speed it up. The inmates go into action on the morning of February 19, 1944, when a Vichy inspector general visited the prison. They captured the warden, the inspector general, and some of the guards. In a matter of hours, the prisoners silently took control. Control of almost the entire prison. At around 5 p.m., all that's left to escape is the main courtyard. This is the final phase of the escape plan. The inmates, disguised as guards, set out to take over the guardhouse. What they don't count on is the fact that just a few yards away, they'll find the guardhouse. Was that a few meters away, through this entrance door, a common law prisoner would come in and raise the alarm? A few hours later, German occupation troops surrounded the prison, threatening to raise it to the ground with cannons. Long negotiations begin with the prisoners. The prisoners obtain a promise that there will be no reprisals, and finally surrendered their weapons during the night. Thus ended the greatest escape attempt of the Second World War. For the Vichy regime, however, the uprising was a humiliation. Repression was merciless. Darnand, who was general secretary of the IA, the lord and head of the militia, came in person to make an example. And so he calls for 50 hostages to be shot. To punish this attempted liberation from what Vichy considered the safest prison in France, The promise made to the prisoners was broken by the Vichy authorities. In the end, 12 prisoners considered to be the ringleaders of the operation were condemned to death and shot in the prison yard. They died singing the Marseillaise, sung in chorus by their comrades just a few yards away. In detention, Three months later, the one 200 resistance prisoners in ISIS prison were handed over by the Vichy regime to the Das Reich division and deported to Dachau. 400 of them died in the camps. The ISIS power station, for its part, is still an active, an active prison. More than 700 kilometers to the north in the town of Dieppe, other Frenchmen, too, quietly resisted the occupying forces. Under its cliffs, the town's authorities dug tunnels. During the Second World War, at first a simple shelter like so many others. However, during an incredible and little-known episode of the Second World War, the site was transformed. It was to be transformed. It was to become a hospital with state-of-the-art equipment capable of safely accommodating hundreds of civilians. A hospital known to all Diepoi, but unknown to the Germans. How and why was this secret hospital created? A look back at the incredible story of an act of citizen resistance. So here we are in the heart of Dieppe, in a mysterious location little known to the locals surrounded by cliffs with 40 meters of cliff above. It's a place that houses several hundred meters of galleries. 
which during the Second World War sheltered the inhabitants of Dieppe during the bombardment. From the 1930 onwards, the rise of fascism in Europe prompted French cities to prepare for the worst. Passive defense was born. The aim was to protect the civilian population against possible bombing. So we built small shelters and shored up a few cellars, but we soon realized that the 12 zero inhabitants were too numerous to be sheltered in simple cellars. So we began digging galleries under the cliffs to protect the population beneath 40 meters of chalk. Work on digging the galleries began in early 1940, during what is known as the Foley War. In this shelter, the passive defense forces had planned for everything. 1,200 seats, electricity to light the galleries, chemical toilets, and a 12 cubic meter food reserve to last a month. May 1940. Dieppe was hit by the first German bombardments. For the first time, residents took refuge in the galleries. Everyone had about a meter to sit here, could put their little shopping bag next to them and, and have a snack. And then people would do different activities, knitting, playing cards. He'd have a little snack. In short, he always managed to keep himself busy. The children always had a little place to play and the aim was to pass the time. A wait that could last from a few minutes to several days. On June 9, 1940, the Germans invaded Dieppe. Occupied, the coastal town became a target for Allied bombing raids. One event in particular had a lasting impact on Dieppe. August 19, 1942. On that day, the Allies attempted to land on Dieppe's beaches. This little known episode was the dress rehearsal for the Normandy landings. Two years later. More than six zero men turned up at Dieppe for an attempted landing to test the Germans to see how they would respond to try and see attacks on a port, a commercial port. The British Navy and Air Force rain shells down on Dieppe. Locked in their shelters, the Germans resisted the assault. On the beaches, Allied soldiers were machine gunned. It was a veritable massacre. Two zero British, Canadian and French soldiers were killed in the battle. Despite safety precautions, the people of Dieppe were hit hard by the fighting. The toll was heavy, 24 dead, 50 wounded, and many buildings destroyed. Sadly, on August 19, 1942, Dieppe realized that this was truly a catastrophe for them. The hospital was too close to the fighting. A solution had to be found quickly to protect the hospital from the fighting and bombing. To this end, the Dieppe town authorities decided to transfer the hospital to the famous bomb shelters. A real technical and logistical challenge, as all this was done behind the Germans' backs. They would never know of the existence of this clandestine hospital. It was a well-kept secret among the people of Dieppe, as Dr. Lesieur, the hospital's chief surgeon, points out in his memoirs. In his book, Dr. Lazure testifies that when he met the mayor to refuel the generator with the two 10-liter cans of fuel oil, he used to say, with an ox on his tongue, which was a good way of putting it, because I'm keeping it a secret. It's a very, very Norman expression. Le bœuf sur la langue, c'est voilà. 
Everyone keeps the secret, but it was a secret for the Germans. How did they not know? I don't know. By September 1943, the secret hospital was up and running. It was headed by Dr. Lezure, but also by Dr. Maillard, who was in charge of general medicine. Beneath the cliffs, everything was designed to function as in a real hospital. Starting with this ward. So here we are in the hospital entrance. The arrival area for the wounded and sick. Imagine a corridor here, in the middle of each side. Six places for the wounded who arrived. They were then directed either to the operating room, to be taken straight away by the doctors, or directed to the hospital for treatment by the nurses. 1,500 people were treated here during the Second World War. Although clandestine, the hospital had all the comforts to accommodate patients. A large hospital gallery. Another for intensive care patients. A maternity ward. 21 babies were born beneath the 40-meter cliff face. But above all, a real surgical department. Here we find a large room, also concreted, which was sterilized on the floor. This is the operating room. Two operating theaters enabled one or two, one or two doctors to operate directly on patients here. A large electric block with a big light gave the doctor, the doctor to have a good view of the wound so he could treat it. This room was also directly connected to the nurse's room and the doctor's room. So here we are in an important room of the hospital, as it was the doctor's restroom. When they weren't on duty, Dr. Lezure would make sculptures. Here we see the coat of arms of the town of Dieppe. There's also a drawing of a nose, so we're not sure whether it's Dr. Lezure's or Dr. Mayard's. From early 1944, Allied bombing raids intensified on Dieppe. Under the cliffs, the medical teams lived to the rhythm of the attacks. So here we find ourselves in a small cramped room that served as a cupboard and was known as the Bar de la Trouille. Bombing time. The nurses who were next door and their children when they were with them used to hide and huddle here. It really was the safest place in the underground. And to further protect the hospital. The Dieppe town authorities even tried to discreetly to pass messages to the Allies. In the middle of this site, all the mana that had been extracted had been spread out and with bricks that had been crushed. Passive defense had succeeded in drawing a red cross in the center to warn Allied planes not to bomb the place, as it was a hospital. Since it was a hospital... On September 1944, Dieppe was liberated by the Allies. The hospital continued to operate until February 1000, 1945. From then on, it is abandoned and falls into oblivion. In Aix-en-Provence, in southeastern France, another forgotten site was rediscovered a few years ago, the Mills camp. A former tilery converted into an internment camp. But that's not the only mystery of this place. Why, at the start of the war, did France lock up here those it should have been protecting, namely opponents of the Nazi regime? 
Why did it then organize their escape under unbelievable conditions? And how did this place come to lead a double life by becoming a cog in the Nazi death machine? A sad destiny that began in September 1939. France declared war on Nazi Germany. The former tile factory was requisitioned by the French army. It became an internment camp. The Third Republic decided to open internment camps in France for enemy subjects. So who were these enemy subjects? Foreigners living on French territory from countries against which France would wage war. At the outset, what the French authorities considered to be... Les Mille Internes was their nationality, the fact that they were German or Austrian, what the locals, without being fooled, call debauchery. So why lock up these foreigners? The government, and above all the French military general staff, consider them dangerous. The authorities are in fact convinced that France is an impregnable fortress that can only be destabilized from within by the existence of a... of a fifth column. A climate of suspicion took hold of the country. Foreigners were the first to be targeted. It was thought that among these foreigners who had immigrated to France, soldiers who would take up arms in the name of starting the war and who would form a military column in the heart of France. And we're terrified of this. We've checked by 100 because our men, our forces, are concentrated on the borders. We figure that if a German military column rises up in the middle of France, it will be capable of overthrowing the Republic in a matter of days. However, at the Les Milles camp, the internees had absolutely no spy or military profile. They were mainly vacationers, artists, or intellectuals. Many were even refugees who had left Germany, frightened by the rise of Nazism. The German intelligentsia, who had taken refuge on the Côte d'Azur in particular, because they were seen primarily as Germans or Austrians. The fact that they were anti-Nazi was not taken into account. The Les Mills camp opened in a hurry on September 6, 1939. It was summarily fitted out. The military set up barbed wire around the tilery and installed straw bales for the internees to sleep on. When the internees arrived at the Les Mills camp, they were taken inside this building, on the ground floor of this building in which we are now. And the atmosphere they discover in this building is quite similar to the one we discover today. There are no real plans to accommodate the internees in this former factory. And yet their numbers continue to grow week after week. The number of internees will soon reach 2,500. We're going to have up to 3,500 people locked up at the same time in a building that used to be a working factory. 60 workers before the camp opened. A single tap supplies non-potable water, and there aren't even any toilets in this overcrowded camp. In this overcrowded camp, the internees therefore had to live with deplorable hygiene conditions. The sewers run right into the middle of people, right into the middle of people sleeping. Problems with internal parasites led to epidemics, notably of diphtheria, and every time a man got up to go to the latrine, he would have to fight a dozen times. And when you were a victim of an epidemic yourself, we couldn't take the blows anymore, and we ended up deciding to relieve ourselves where we slept. To relieve ourselves where we slept. Despite these deplorable living conditions, the internees were not to give up. Starting with the artists, some of whom were already famous, such as painters Hans Bellmer, and Max Ernst, and writer, Lion Feuchtwanger. With the blessing of the camp commandant, they tried to breathe a little life back into this hellish place. Every day, the internees organized conferences, painting and sculpture workshops. They even set up a cabaret in the old Tuileries oven. We're at Die Catacomb, a symbolic place in Les Mille's camp history. Die Katakomba is the name of a Berlin protest cabaret, very famous in Germany. 
which was closed by Joseph Goebbels as soon as Hitler came to power in 1000, 1933. The first German internees to arrive at the Les Milles camp tried to recreate the catacomb, a place of artistic expression considered by many internees as a place of freedom. Imagine this place covered with paint and theater sets completely hiding the oven. The activity in 1947 caused the loss and destruction of these paintings, except for a hint of paint at the back of the kiln behind me. For several months, the Les Meals camp was the scene of an intense cultural ferment, in stark contrast to the appalling living conditions. Even today, there are still many traces, decorations and graffiti on the walls. But life at the Les Meals camp was about to be turned upside down. From June 1940 onwards, the collapse of the French army led to fears of the imminent arrival of the Nazis in the south of France. At Les Mills camp, panic set in. Most of the people here are opponents of the fascist regime. To the fascist regime, many are condemned to death by their own countries. They are convinced that if the German army finds them here, or the Italian army which is arriving from the east, they would either be executed on the spot or sent home to be executed. The internees must flee France as quickly as possible. It's a matter of life and death. To do this, they will not hesitate to ask the camp commandant for help. Aware that the internees' lives were in great danger, the French officer does the unthinkable. Against the advice of his superiors, he commandeered a train. Thanks to him, two zero internees were able to leave the Les Mills camp. An incredible adventure. It's the episode known as the Freedom Train, or the Ghost Train. So why the Ghost Train? Because this train does not appear in the train registers. It's not authorized. There's another important factor. We don't want the German army to be able to trace this train, and therefore the internees who took it. The internees had no right to make mistakes. They could be unmasked or caught at any moment. On June 22, 1940, the ghost train left Les Mills station, heading for the Atlantic coast. Thanks to the complicity of the railway workers, the train crosses the south of France, running when the tracks are not in use. A high voltage journey. Three days later, the unthinkable happens. A terrible misunderstanding. While passing through Toulouse station, one of the train's officers sends the following information. To the station master at Bayonne, I'm arriving with a train of krauts, so I'll need to bring some food. He was referring to the internees of the Mademoiselle's camp. But the Bayonne station master, who at the same time heard on the radio, like all the other Frenchmen, that the German army was arriving in the south, was convinced that it was a German army train. And he took the decision to lock down Bayonne station and force all incoming trains to turn back. Big disillusionment and back to square one for the internees of the ghost train, who were forced to return to the Les Milles camp. Another twist of fate on June 25, 1940. The armistice signed between France and Germany came into force. France was cut in two. To the north, the occupied zone. To the south, the free zone. To the south, the free zone. The Les Mills camp was now beyond the reach of the Nazis. From then on, most of them were able to go into exile. The Mills camp seemed destined to be abandoned. The Vichy government gave it a new function. No longer an artist's camp, it became an airlock to death. From the summer of 1000, 1940, Pierre Laval's government agreed to take part in the final solution. The Vichy regime promised the Nazis to hand over all foreign Jews in the free zone. Roundups multiplied throughout France. Jewish families were rounded up at the Les Meal camp a few days before being deported. Trains were prepared on the deportation platform, which you can see just behind me. At 5 a.m. the next morning, families were called to gather in the courtyard to be screened, reading the names from lists that had already been prepared. 
and the people were taken by the reserve mobile guards to the deportation dock. For a month, deportation followed deportation. To add insult to injury, children from the age of one were deported with their parents. The Germans had not asked for this. The Vichy government proposed it. It was a time of extreme emotional intensity, during which there were a large number of suicides at the Les Mille's camp, particularly on the windows located right on that level. One of these windows was just behind me, through which the internees could see the train and the people being taken away in the wagons. One memorable suicide among the internees was the mothers, mentioned in many testimonials, who jumped out of the window with their two babies. In all, around two zero Jews were deported from the Les Mules camp during this period. Forgotten after the war, the history of the Mills camp was not rediscovered until the early 1980s. Today, the former tile factory has become a place of remembrance, a place that reminds us that horror was very much present in France. Denial of justice, summary executions, and murderous madness. During the Second World War, the Third Reich and the Vichy regime subjected the French people to the worst atrocities. We'll now look at what happened in the occupied zone. The excesses of the Nazi regime knew no bounds. From 1943, Hitler had only one obsession, to end the war that had gone on far too long. He entrusted the Reich's scientists with a mission of the utmost importance, to find the Wunderwaffe, the miracle weapon. Ever more destructive, that would turn the tide of the war and enable the Nazis to impose their domination on Europe. And it's in Mimoyekes, near Calais, in an incredible underground bunker, that one of the most devastating weapons of the Second World War is to be stored. This place behind me is a secret base. In fact, you can only see one gallery here behind me. And the purpose of this place is to, to send, by means of a crazy project, a multiple charge cannon, more than three zero shells a day into central London. This crazy project is this weapon, the V3, a revolutionary cannon. Imagine several tubes which, once assembled, reach a length of 127 meters. A record for the time. The weapon's range was also a record, 165 kilometers. Just enough to reach London. The aim was clearly to get the British to surrender quickly with a weapon that remained a terrorist weapon. It is there to kill indiscriminately, to kill civilian victims. Any means necessary to make England surrender. So the Nazis stopped looking for the fatal weapon. The V3 multiple charge gun is part of a wider program, the famous secret weapon V. Three was to complete the arsenal alongside the Vone flying bomb and Werner von Braun's fearsome VTW stratospheric rocket to house these secret weapons. During the summer of 1943, the Germans built numerous facilities in northern France. It was against this backdrop that work began at Mimoyekes. The site was not chosen by chance. The aim was to be far enough from the coast not to be visible to the enemy and close enough to a high voltage power line or a railroad line and to be within easy reach of the British capital because here, as the crow flies, we're 165 kilometers from Big Ben. Construction of the Mimoyekes base was entrusted to the TOT organization, responsible for the Reich's major military projects. Although only a few accessible galleries remain today, the original project was gigantic and the resources involved were considerable. 
1,500 men were mobilized day and night on the site. Mimoyekes is a veritable underground city. Once the site is finished, the work is done. 1,200 people have to work here on two levels. The first level is less than 30 meters underground. This 600 meter long gallery will house the ammunition, the garrison, and the various men. And then on the 100 meter level, 70 meters below our feet, people who will be at the base of the cannon. The problem is that such a large base is unlikely to go unnoticed. So the Germans took great care to build this fortress in the chalk to protect it from Allied bombardment. But the Allies knew that the threat was real. Detecting the Reich's secret constructions was therefore a top priority. During the Second World War, two methods were used to try and find these unseen secret sites. The first method is intelligence. Intelligence from the resistance services who will inform here that something abnormal is going on. And then the second piece of information comes from the Royal Air Force, which developed aerial photography during the Second World War. The aim was to fly over a site, photograph it, and a few weeks later, take the same photograph again to see if anything had happened. It's the game of seven differences. In 1943, the Allies and Nazis were in a race against time to build the Mimoyekes fortress. The work was progressing at a rapid pace. Above all, the Germans had to solve a major problem, making the famous V3 cannon work. The main technological challenge was to invent a new shell. World War I shells resemble suppositories. Their air penetration coefficient was not good. They break a lot. What's more, they're rotated in the barrel, so they're connected to the gun when it starts up. And because they're stable, they don't go as far. If you want to go very far, very fast, you need shells that are undercalibrated. In other words, if the cannon fires, the shell has to have a much smaller diameter. That way, it won't hit the wall. The Germans believe they've found the solution. One of their most eminent specialists creates the arrow shell. A veritable revolution. It's going to look like a dart. It will be very long and will be able to go farther. It will have a better aerodynamic coefficient. But to hit London right in the heart, the arrow shell has to reach the staggering speed of one 500 meters per second. That's just over four times the speed of sound. And that's where the V3 cannon comes in specially designed to accelerate the aero shell all the way out of the cannon. The shell begins with a standard charge and travels through a lengthy barrel over 127 meters in length. And each time it passes in front of so-called auxiliary charges, they will start up again to propel it, all the more so as there are 32 successive accelerations inside the barrel. And the shell will exit at the incredible speed of 1 500 meters per second, which corresponds to just over 5 zero kilometers per hour. The V3 was first tested in Germany in May 1943. The Allies intensified their surveillance of northern France. And on September 18, 1943, the Royal Air Force spotted the digging of two railway tunnels at the secret base at Mimoyekes. From then on, the fortress became a priority target for Allied bombing raids. The Mimoyeke site was probably the largest special construction site bombed during the Second World War. Over four zero tons of bombs were dropped. It's as if four zero cars descended on the site of the fortress of Mimoyekes. 4,000 tons of bombs devastate the landscape. The town next door, landreton le nord was totally destroyed. Six 500 bombs fall from the sky. Shells rain down on the fortress of Mimoyekes. A deluge of bombs and yet Mimoyekis suffered very little damage. But the message is clear, the Germans are under pressure. They knew that time was running out and that the Allies would soon return to the fray. The base had to be made operational as quickly as possible. In Germany, they intensify V3 tests. Failure after failure, they had to solve a serious design problem. 
Everything happens in the first 127 meters. It's like clockwork, very, very meticulous. The successive charges in the barrel have to explode. Explode after the shell has passed, pushing it forward. The last thing you want is for it to explode beforehand because that would obviously slow it down. As it happens, however, when the primary charge explodes, gas sometimes protrudes from the shell at the rear of the gun and set fire to the front auxiliary powder. This in turn slows down the shell as it moves forward. In other words, if the gun's auxiliary charges explode before the arrow shell passes, they will slow it down instead of accelerating it, thus reducing its speed. So, in effect, it's a synchronization point. The shell will never reach more than 1,100 meters per second, so there's almost a fifth of the speed missing for the ejection velocity. That's a real technological problem. A problem that is delaying the commissioning of Mimoyekes. And the Allies intend to take full advantage. The failure of the first bombing raids forced them to revise their plans for destroying the Mimoyekes fortress. They're going to use a new kind of bomb, the Tall Boy. Six meters high, two and a half tons of a powerful explosive, Torpex D. The aim of this giant bomb is to create a mini earthquake so that the underground installations collapse. The tall boy will be dropped from 5,500 meters and hit the ground at 1, 200 kilometers per hour. It will then sink to a depth of 30 meters depending on the soil and it certainly won't explode immediately. The idea is for it to freeze in the ground and there's a delay that counts. Between 30 seconds and a quarter of an hour, depending on your needs. And only after this time will it explode. To clear a huge crater around it, 30 meters deep and 50, maybe 40 or 50 meters wide. All that remained was to test the effectiveness of this superpowered bomb. On July 6, 1944, the British dropped two tall boy on the fortress of Mimoyekes. The air attack was a success. Mimoy gave way at the end of the raid. The damage was so extensive that the Germans decided to condemn the site. To condemn the site, it was evacuated 20 days later. It was clear that not a single shell would ever be fired from Mimoyekes. It was a bitter failure for the Reich. We put human and financial resources into a place we built, but the very technology of the V3 cannon would never be perfected. We thought we could do it fast. In 1943 and 1944, we did very badly perhaps a sign that the Nazi regime was already on the verge of collapse. Despite the resources committed, V3 technology was quickly abandoned by the Nazis. As for the Mimoyekes base, it was definitively neutralized after the war. During the Second World War, the Germans imposed their domination throughout the occupied zone. And even in the heart of Paris, at Les Invalides. On the night of December 14, 1944, at around one o'clock in the morning, a convoy of German soldiers arrived at Les Invalides. They carried a huge bronze sarcophagus containing the ashes of Napoleon's son. In the courtyard, 200 Republican guards formed a double hedge to receive the coffin. The Germans have set up a whole ceremonial with the SS torches, flags, SS runes and so on. What does this odd ceremony at the Invalides mean? Why are the Germans staging what strongly resembles an SS pagan ritual under the Great Dome? To understand this story, we need to go back to June 1940. The day after the signing of the armistice between France and the Third Reich, Hitler went to Paris as a victor. He wanted to make the most of his victory. A 
accompanied by some 30 dignitaries of the Nazi regime. The Führer drives through the deserted capital in the early hours of the morning. Hitler comes to Paris with his favorite architect and sculptor. And it's almost a sightseeing tour as he comes to see the view of the Eiffel Tower from the Palais de Chaillot and to see the Invalides. The Invalides is the highlight of the Führer's visit. He absolutely wants to visit the majestic tomb of Napoleon the Führer. And for the occasion, he'll even don a big white coat. White is often the ceremonial uniform. It's true that in France, for example, grand outfits are often all or part white. There's even an expression which refers to the 1,931 model and which has become part of everyday language to dress up. I believe that Hitler certainly had a hidden reverence for Napoleon and so he will indeed take this opportunity to realize of this fantastic mausoleum. Under the dome of the Invalides, Hitler takes a long bow before the Red Quartz tomb. A theatrical attitude which, in fact, is an exact replica of a gesture made by Napoleon himself in 1806. After inflicting defeat on the Prussian armies, the Emperor went to Potsdam to visit the tomb of Frederick II. Hitler wanted to place himself in a particularly prestigious historical continuity with this visit and this gesture in the knowledge that, of course, he himself sees himself in a 1,000-year Reich. At the end of his visit, Hitler ordered that the ashes of Leglon, Napoleon's son, hitherto kept in Austria, be returned to France. The aim was to seal the reconciliation between Germany and France in the future greater Nazi Europe. A seemingly spontaneous decision. The decision had been proposed to him several years earlier. In the 1930s, under the guise of Franco-German reconciliation. Franco-German reconciliation were in some ways already preparing for what was to become collaboration. The fate of Leglon's ashes was thus closely linked to the politics of collaboration. The politics of collaboration is a bit like, give me your watch and I'll tell you the time. It's something they don't commit themselves to. He's clearly in the habit of signing documents that only bind those who believe in them. So in the end, he doesn't expect much from the collaboration. What he does expect is for France to be willing to let itself be plundered. This one-way collaboration was not to Philippe Pétain's liking. The old marshal was now suspicious of the Führer. And so, when he received Hitler's invitation to attend the ceremony for the return of Leglon's ashes to Paris, he politely declined. Pétain was afraid of a coup de force. He was afraid he would be taken hostage in Paris and put under the authority of the ultra-collaborationists. And these ultra-collaborationists had all created Nazi-inspired parties. Pétain would have none of it, and he didn't want to be at their side in Paris. The day before the ceremony, December 13, 1940, Pierre Laval went to Vichy in person to persuade Pétain to reverse his decision. The marshal was unsuccessful. It was now clear that the vice president was going behind his back to remove him from power. The figure of this possible conspiracy is Laval. It's Laval who looks at him with a highly suspicious air. And however much Laval shows good faith and a willingness to obey, the marshal is not fooled. The very same day, Philippe Pétain dismisses Pierre Laval. It was a thunderclap for the former who had not seen it coming and protested loudly. Pétain told him he couldn't work together, that he doesn't share the same policy direction and that under these conditions he doesn't want to keep him in government. 
to keep him in government. Laval dismissed. Marshal Pétain absent. The operation to return Leglon's ashes was a fiasco for Hitler. Hitler's hoped-for moment of reconciliation was a missed opportunity. It was a great moment of unanimous communion between the French nation and the German nation. Emptied of its political content, the ceremony is now merely symbolic. As a result, the Germans have prepared an impressive display, a decorum reminiscent of some kind of mystical drift that some Nazi dignitaries were accustomed to. The date of the ceremony, the night of December 1415, 1940, is also symbolic. It is the centenary of the return of Napoleon Führer's tomb. On December 15, 1840, the idea was to mark the occasion and for the first time in Paris, French military and German military authorities came together in Paris for the first time in a unique, atypical event. We are at the Gare de l'Est on December 14, 1940. It is 9 p.m. The bronze sarcophagus containing the ashes of Napoleon's son has just arrived on a special train from Vienna. 24 soldiers are needed to lift out the 800 kilo coffin and place it on an artillery extension. It was then transferred to Les Invalides. The convoy takes a very long time to cross Paris. You have to imagine that it's nighttime, that it's the occupation, snowy weather and curfew. At around 1 a.m., the convoy finally arrived at Les Invalides. The German soldiers handed over the heavy sarcophagus of Napoleon's son to the Republican guards. Few French guests attended the ceremony. General Law represented Marshal Pétain and Admiral Darlan, the Vichy government. But the bulk of the troops were ultra-collaborationists. In fact, this German ceremony in occupied Paris summed up what collaboration was all about. First and foremost, a gigantic fool's bargain. They stole our coal and gave us ashes. At the end of the ceremony, Leglon's sarcophagus was deposited in this chapel and quickly faded into oblivion until 1968 when a more dignified location was found for it. He was finally buried in a vault opposite his father. Today, only an engraving on the ground shows where he is buried. The Second World War profoundly changed the face of our country, leaving behind many places of remembrance. From here to the dark destiny of the huge underground bunkers planted all over the country. Places steeped in history. France's Second World War sites have yet to reveal all their secrets.